Hello, everyone, and welcome back to 305 Insights. Once again, Alan here. Today, we're going to be discussing the Miami Hurricanes and a very, very important pickup that they just received recently with the addition of Cam Ward in the transfer portal. Now, we previously discussed this at the beginning of the month, talking about how Mauro Cristobal is going to need to find a way to use his recruiting prowess, as well as the power of the NIL collective at the University of Miami to try and find a quarterback. And once Cam Ward earlier in the month declared, or I believe it was late last month, declared that he was going to the NFL, it was a mad scramble as to who they were going to get next, because they had Will Howard on campus, and further research showed that he was never really willing to commit on the spot as previous reports had been told. He was still open to visiting other places, and obviously he went to Ohio State after visits to USC and Ohio State. They were looking at Malachi Nelson, who I believe went to Boise State. He was only transferred out of the University of Southern California, USC. And K.J. Jefferson, a former Arkansas quarterback, who ended up going to UCF. So there's a lot going on with that. And they did receive a commitment from a transfer quarterback. And it was a young kid from Albany who led the FBS or FCS in passing touchdowns. But we'll, we'll, we'll get to him later. We really need to focus on Cam Ward and how he raises the floor of this team. And we'll kind of look at the schedule really briefly because we'll, we'll do this later on once all the transfer portals are closed and different things like that in the summer. And you really have an understanding of who's going to be on the team. But they're leading off against the Gators next year. So you obviously really want to win that game, considering Florida rarely, if ever, plays UM anymore. And especially once the SEC expands, there really is a high likelihood that these games are going to be few and far between. So this might be the last one in a long time. You really want to win that one. And with Cam Ward, you automatically become the favorites in that game. You probably were a slight betting favorite considering all the talent that Florida has lost in the offseason due to the transfer portal and just kids graduating. So you're ideally going to start off the season with a resounding victory with that. And then September, at least the first three of September's schedule looks really easy. You got Florida A&M, Ball State, and USF. And then from there, you go into the ACC schedule. So going into last year, I thought the ceiling was 9-3 and three and the floor was 7-5, and five, but they should go 8-4. and four. And they went 7-5. and five. If you add Cam Ward to this team, this team should win 10 games. The most difficult games on your schedule are going to be Florida State and at Louisville. With the talent that this team has, you shouldn't have a problem with California or Cal. Georgia Tech, even though we all know what happened last year with the kneel down that never occurred. Duke is going to be going through a transitional period without Riley Leonard and Mike Elko as their coach. Riley Leonard was your QB. And you're running into your one of your favorite uh, past coaches in Manny Diaz. So we'll see how Duke pans out in the year, but that shouldn't be a real issue. Wake Forest should be fine. Syracuse will be very competitive next year due to all the transfers that they're getting, but We'll see how that really plays out on paper. And Virginia Tech is going to be sneaky next year, I think. 
not going to be great, but you're starting to pick it up under their head coach that they hired a few years ago. Once they got rid of the guy from Memphis, Brian, uh, no, Justin Fuentes. So the reason why they were pursuing Cam Ward so vigorously is because of how he fits this offense. And again, we made that tidbit earlier in the month where we said he has until January 15th because he never hired an agent when he declared for the NFL draft. He had till the 15th to revert his decision to come back to college. And sure enough, he did that the weekend before. So why are people so high on Cam Ward going to Miami? One, his talent level. And two, the offensive system that Shannon Dawson runs. He's got, again, we've discussed this, but Dawson runs an air raid that isn't imbalanced. Because whenever people think of air raid, they think of the classic Mike Leach type stuff where you're throwing the ball 50, 60 times a game and not really running the ball as much. Dawson is very much closer to a 55-45 split, even almost like 52-48. So he does incorporate a power rushing attack, which is why, again, I think Cristobal hired him. And you're seeing that with the acquisition of talent at running backs throughout the past two recruiting cycles and the transfer portal. So, Cam Ward is someone who threw for almost 3,800 yards, 25 touchdowns, 7 interceptions, and completed basically 67% of his passes. He also ran for 144 yards and 8 touchdowns. So, this is a guy who... When you look at the raw statistics, he's the second most productive returning power five quarterback behind Carson Beck, who played for Georgia. And he had two extra games to, you know, pad his stats compared to Ward. So, again, it's not. It's it's the ceiling that we're talking about here. He raises the floor, but the ceiling is much higher. Washington State didn't necessarily have the type of athletes that are at his disposal in multiple parts of the field. I'm not saying that UM's wide receiving core is going to be great next year, but the major difference is going to be the running game and the offensive line. This offensive line, we've been singing their praises all year, and they're going to be just as good next year, if not better. I mean, you're returning Jalen Rivers, Inez Cooper, Francis Maoga. You got in the Indiana transfer Zach Carpenter at center. And you've got people that you can rotate in there. You've got Matthew McCoy, Markel Bell, Tommy Kinsler, Samson Okunlola, who was another five-star prospect in the same class as Francis Maoga. This is the same offensive line that Pro Football Focus, PFF, rated them as the 10th overall pass-blocking bunch, while the run-blocking was number three, I'm sorry, number 33 overall in the country. So you have the talent at running back to kind of offset the number 33 part, but having the 10th overall pass-blocking unit, and you have a guy with the caliber of Cam Ward, it, it's it's going to make a difference. And he he's not going to be what TVD was in the second half of the season where he loses his confidence. Now, to be fair, there is a turnover issue with Cam Ward where he fumbles the ball. And again, he threw uh, seven picks. So seven picks isn't terrible, but it's the fumbling and the total amount of turnovers that he accrued last season, which may be an issue. But if he bottles that up, this is a UM offense that went from 23.6 points per game under the first year of Mario Cristobal to 31.5. 
They increased their yards per game from 366 to 431. Yards per play increased as well from 4.8 to 6.1. And again, the offensive line winning in the trenches, the Mario Cristobal type team is going to be prevalent. You're going to have Mark Fletcher coming back at running back. You're going to have a Jay Allen. You're going to have, uh, I believe Henry Parrish is going to be coming back. Those are three running backs right there that are, are already familiar with the system. And then you're going to have the young guys, talented guys, even someone like Javante Citizen, who can't stay healthy, but he's got all the talent in the world. He's probably going to make a run here and there. There's a lot of talent that can be rotated into that running back position to take pressure off of Cam Ward. You got Restrepo coming back. 85 receptions, 6 touchdowns, over 1,000 yards, almost 1,100 yards. Jacoby George, I mean, if he gets his head on right and doesn't commit those ridiculous personal foul penalties or just mishaps on the field where he fumbles the ball 30 yards behind the line of scrimmage and just never recovers. It's the first season under Dawson. 57 passes, 8 touchdowns, 864 yards. And then you're going to have the younger guys coming in. You're going to have someone like Ray Ray Joseph. You know, they were really high on him, recruiting him last year. He only played, he played under 70 offensive snaps. He only caught 6 passes for 36 yards. But... He's got plenty of explosive play potential. He's got yak written all over him. And that this is a kid that you should expect to step up next year. And so again, when you're when you're looking at their personnel, there's a reason why I'm having the expectations even before the whole transfer portal stuff concludes Mario has built the trenches you got the offensive line you've got a lot coming back on the defensive line you've had some transfers coming in on the defensive line you're even going to expect more out of tight ends this year Elijah Royal should be a little better once he recovers completely from his knee injury Riley Williams played 200 offensive snaps or over 200 offensive snaps gives him experience in the system ideally in year two with someone like cam ward this can open up some more possibilities this is this is something that i also have to consider as well when we're talking about this did tyler van dyke hold back some of dawson's ability to call plays Because you saw multiple times throughout the year, and even when TVD came back to play once they were starting Emory Williams, a lot of the plays that were called for him were to his safety blanket in Xavier Restrepo. There wasn't a lot of productions out of the tight ends. And you lost Colby Young as a transfer to Georgia. So with Cam Ward, what type of expanded play calling will there be for the tight ends? Will there be for the secondary receivers? There's a lot of untapped potential with all the stats that we were talking about of year-over-year improvement with the offense for Miami. There could be another jump on the way. And again, this is a team that is significantly more talented than the vast majority of the teams in the ACC. Outside of, probably on paper, outside of Florida State and Clemson, but you're not running into Clemson. You're not even running into North Carolina or NC State. 
Again, this is your ACC slate. Cal, Georgia Tech, Louisville, Duke, Florida State, Virginia Tech, Wake Forest, Syracuse. That is not that difficult. You're out of conference. USF, Ball State, Florida A&M, and Florida. You should go 4-0 against those teams with the talent that you have. And this is where we transition to the questions about Mario Cristobal. You preach to your kids about the U is back, back to work. You know, all the practices that you're going to put in in the summer, strength and conditioning, the way you fundamentally believe football should be played, that you on the trenches should be able to push around your opponents, and you'll win that way. The way Michigan won, the way Michigan ran through this season, is the blueprint that Mario Cristobal has tried to build at Oregon, where he won Pac-12 titles over there, and what he's trying to build here at the U. You have the talent. It's there. You have multiple recruiting classes now where you have the personnel that you want. You have the ability to go in the transfer portal and get the type of personnel that you want. Obviously, you're not hitting on everybody that you want, but you're getting enough in there where you shouldn't be struggling. And that was the most concerning part in the past season. He cannot have that again this year. Our conversations are going to be needed. And because this university has put a lot of resources into this program, they made the commitment to him to give him that big eight-year I believe it's roughly $80 million. There are private institutions so that don't really have to reveal it. But it's I know the reports were an eight-year deal for Cristobal. You hired Kevin Steele, and then he left after a year. You hired Josh Gaddis, and then you let him go after a year. And then you turn around, and you hire someone like Shane Dawson. Or Shannon Dawson, sorry. You hire someone like Lance Guidry. You hire someone like Jason Taylor. There's a previous podcast that we did where I believe they hired seven total new position coaches. This is a program that shows they want to win and they're making the necessary investments to win. Now it's up for this coaching staff to show that they can win. And again, Cristobal won at Oregon, but he fell short in a few areas. Is that going to be the same thing at his alma mater? That is, like we said, the $80 million in terms of his contract question. Because back in the pre-transfer portal era, back before... Even someone like Willie Taggart was hired or Chad Morris was hired at Arkansas. A coach had a minimum of three years to show progress. Because one, you need to clean out the old culture from the previous coach and get in your guys. And that wasn't as easy five, ten years ago, even four years ago. But... Now it is. And so Mario's judged on a different scale compared to Manny Diaz, Mark Rick, Al Golden, Randy Shannon, Larry Coker, all those guys. And this is why next year is a pivotal year. They didn't meet expectations this year. They need to meet expectations next year. And for all intents and purposes, they are most likely going to be favored in all their games, if not but one against FSU. And even then, depending on how the season goes, you might actually have UM as a battering favorite due to the amount of talent that FSU lost, even though they are replacing it with their 
additions in the transfer portal. However, the game is going to be played at Doe Campbell South, a.k.a. Hard Rock. So we'll see if that makes a difference. It's always the biggest game of the year in terms of crowd for UM. Even though it might not be as many UM fans as the program would like. But for the most part, like we said, we went through the whole schedule. They're going to be favored in pretty much every single game. It's on this coaching staff to execute that. Again, there was plenty of talent this year. Plenty. You had the likes of Cam Kitchens and James Williams in the back. You had Leonard Taylor in the front or in the middle. And then you had the boys on the side. You had Reuben Baines step up even when he had some injuries. You had my well got linebacker who, who, who played his position well and he's coming back. You had that offensive line that played really well. You were just missing that piece at quarterback, the all-important piece. Once Tyler Van Dyke just mentally wasn't the same person after the first month, first five, six games of the season, it was all downhill from there. You don't expect that from Cam Ward, so you don't expect the drop-off in the second half of the season. Because that's what's happened to UM over the past two decades, it seems. You start off hot, and then you limp to the finish. Even in the season, the, the, the 2017 season, where Mark Rick really got, you know, hit everything, and you start off 10-0. and 0. You lose to Pitt. You lose to Clemson. You lose to Wisconsin. You finish 10-3. and 3. There was, though, I believe it was 2013 under Al Golden, where they start off 7-0, and 0, and it was the last matchups of the unbeatens that, that season in terms of two teams being unbeaten, not just one. And FSU beat UM. And then UM finished 8-4, and 7-5 and five after starting off undefeated. Last year, everything was looking good up until that Georgia Tech game. And then you lost the North Carolina game. And then the NC State game happened. The FSU game happened. It's just the accumulation of things where it, it becomes like, oh, here we go again, you know, that sort of mentality with this program and that's what Chris wants to change he's gotten his players you know they're they're really how much is left of the Manny Diaz regime how much of that what I think he would call a sickness is left with the way he runs the program with the way his mentality is in practicing and winning the trenches you got to think he's cleaned it up a lot there's no excuses next year. And that's a different kind of pressure. Because this is your alma mater. This is the program that you are, you know, we use this phrase a lot in this this podcast. You're the prodigal son. You're, you're the man. You're the white knight. You're the savior. Cafecitos and everything. You're fueled by that. And you're going to bring this program back because that's what you believe in your heart that this school and this city deserves. And that's a lot of pressure. And it's even more pressure because it's year three. And you have the quarterback. Again, this wasn't an easy recruitment. Multiple reports have come out like we talked about about the other guys. But Tua's little brother, uh, Tua Tonga Railo's little brother, was looking for a six-year of eligibility. And it looked like he was going to be the next quarterback. Cam Ward came around because we talked about that January 15th date and sent out the feelers again for UM and see, you know, hey, what's going on? Can we do some business here? And even though Nick Saban wrote a letter for the NCAA for the approval of Tunga Vailoa's sixth year, it looked like the NCAA wasn't going to give it to him. And that's where they moved quickly with Cam Ward. And Cam Ward played the game that he needed to play. He might have gotten extra NIL money, you know, and he's going to improve his draft stock ideally with this system and the type of talent that's there in the offensive line and running back room. You could get another wide receiver or you just bank on some of the young guys to step up. 
it's it's this is the part that's concerning is the expectations year one you went five and seven year two you went seven and six year three you have to win 10 games you're going to build a lot of goodwill if you beat down the gators that'll buy a lot of goodwill in this town if you beat both the Gators and the Seminoles, because unlike FSU, UM doesn't have that opportunity every year to be the king of the state, to be the state champions, the Sunshine State champions. They don't have that opportunity. They have that opportunity this year. Will he take it? Will they take it? Will Mario Cristobal have no lapses in terms of the kneeling down the ball at Georgia Tech? Clock management. Will he learn? It's very hard for a coach to consistently ask for perfection from the students and the athletes who look up to him when he's making critical mistakes at the worst time. Don't lose a locker room because of that. I think they will live up to expectations. And that means Mario Cristobal has learned. And this coaching staff has adapted. And I believe that will happen. We'll dissect, you know, the expectations, like we said earlier, in the FSU 1 and probably in this podcast, about what we expect in the upcoming season in terms of wins, losses. There's still a lot to be handled in not only this transfer portal window, in case, you know, Jed Fish was hired from Arizona to Washington. You still have everything that's going on with Alabama. So you have Washington, Alabama, Arizona. You still have other kids left in the transfer portal, but you have those three teams as to where now in the next 30 days kids can decide where they want to go. So you'll see maybe they can get a, 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 a wide receiver that they can use to complement Cam Ward outside of Restrepo and Jacoby George and some of the young guys. So we're going to wrap up this episode. So all in all, great job by Cristobal and the Hurricanes to secure that quarterback that they need. They got that bridge gap to 2025. So we'll see what Poffenhager. I might have butchered that name. I don't remember it off the top of my head. Ja'Cory Brown or Emery Williams, who steps up in 2025. You hope Cam Ward lives up to the billing. And maybe 2024 is the year, folks, where the U is back is real. It's been a really long time. Let's see if it happens. Again, thanks for listening, folks. Have a good one. Remember, we're starting to post on YouTube now. 305 Insights, you can follow us there. Like, subscribe, you know, do all the standard stuff that people tell you to do. We're on Spotify. Like, subscribe. We're posting on Apple Podcasts as, ne- as well now. It's all under the same name, 305 Insights. The way you see it, it's the way you spell it. Lowercase i, capital, Insights the rest of the way. So... Uh, You should be seeing the post of the discussion with the Dolphins, with Miguel and Eric. And we're going to have some more feedback, of course, with FSU and their transfer portal hall. And whatever happens with UM, we'll see what happens, how their portal hall develops as well. And we'll probably do a, a further breakdown of the key players that they're getting in this we'll do a deeper dive with cam ward we'll do a deeper dive with some of the guys that um's got on the defensive end side and with fsu we'll do the same thing so again folks we're posting a lot of spots appreciate you finding us wherever you're listening and thanks for stopping by have a good one we'll catch you on the next one